This is the second video on planning questions. So in the first video, we have looked at what is a planning question, how do we approach a planning question, and what is required in the answers for planning questions. So after going through the examples and practices, a common occurrence is that students get overwhelmed. Um, reason being there are so many different planning questions and um, it gets overwhelming um, to actually memorize the procedure or to know which procedure to use for a particular planning question. Now, this is not uncommon. However, one way to overcome this is to know that planning questions belong to different types and the procedures for experiments in a type of question is usually the same. So instead of seeing each planning question as an isolated um, question with a separate different procedure and um, answer, we can see, we can group them together to the different types of planning questions. Now in general, there are four types of planning questions, quantitative, qualitative, preparation of a certain sort or solution, and investigative. We'll look at each one in greater detail. Now quantitative experiments are those that we want to find out the amount of a particular substance in a sample. So for quantitative planning experiments, we need to plan um, an, an experiment to find out the amount uh, of a, a substance or particular component in a mixture or in a sample. So examples would be the 2018 and 2020 planning question um, where you need to determine the percentage by mass of calcium carbonate in shells as well as to determine the relative molecular mass of a solid um, acid which is your sulfuric acid. So first, I'll briefly go through the approach to solving quantitative planning questions before we look at what is required in the answer. So for quantitative planning questions, usually the approach is this, that we need to fully react the substance with another reactant and measure the amount of a product that is formed. Okay, usually the product is a gas, so we would measure the volume of gas produced. And from the volume of gas produced, we can find the number of moles. And by comparing mole ratio, we can therefore find the amount of the substance um, that was reacted. So for example, uh, calcium carbonate, we can react with an acid and we will produce carbon dioxide gas. Okay, so from the volume of carbon dioxide gas, we can actually find number of moles. And from number of moles of carbon dioxide, by comparing mole ratio, we can actually find the number of moles of calcium carbonate. And from number of moles of calcium carbonate, we can therefore find the mass of calcium carbonate. And the mass percent of calcium carbonate in shells is just the mass of calcium carbonate divided by the mass of the shell sample times 100. So this is the approach um, that we need to um, use. For sulfuric acid, this one is um, less intuitive. However, in the question, they provided the approach, which is to react sulfuric acid, okay, which I will abbreviate as HA, with excess of sodium carbonate. When an acid reacts with sodium carbonate, again, it produces carbon dioxide gas and from the volume of carbon dioxide gas we can find number of moles and from number of moles we can find the um, number of moles of sulfuric acid and given the mass of sulfuric acid we can actually find the molar mass which is equivalent to the relative molecular mass. So you can see that the approaches are very very similar in this case we react um, the substance in which we want to find out the amount of with excess of another reactant so that it's fully reacted and we measure the volume of the gas that's produced. So for such questions, what is required in the answer is this, that you need to have the procedure. In your procedure, you must clearly show the important steps. For example, you must measure the final volume of carbon dioxide produced the chemicals, the important chemicals, 
um, in mentioning the acid or the sodium carbonate, you need to mention that it's added in excess so that your sulfamic acid or your calcium carbonate is fully reacted, okay, as well as the apparatus that are required. Um, for example, if you have, uh, if, if you were to collect a gas, the typical setup would look something like this, where you have a gas range, you have a conical flask, and a delivery tube. We need to have the discussion as well uh, as to tell the marker how you convert the data collected, in this case, the volume of CO2. How do we use volume? How do we um, manipulate the volume of CO2 in order to obtain the percentage by mass of calcium carbonate in the first example, as well as the relative molecular mass of sulfamic acid in the second example. In such questions, sometimes they will even ask for assumptions and precautions. For precautions, um, it, whenever you're using any acids, um, bear in mind that they are corrosive and you need to wear gloves. Assumptions uh, in the question where we are looking at calcium carbonate in shells, for example, you can mention that um, calcium carbonate is the only substance in shells that will react with acids to produce carbon dioxide gas because if there are any other components in shells that produces carbon dioxide gas, then the method that we have used will not be accurate. Next, we'll look at two practice questions on quantitative planning experiments. The first of which is to determine the percentage by mass of water in a hydrated salt. So bear in mind that we are not looking at the percentage by mass of carbonate, um, where we could have used the earlier approach of measuring the volume of carbon dioxide form when fully reacted with an acid. For this question, we will need to use something called a gravimetric approach. Now gravimetric as the term gravity um, implies, we are dealing with the mass of um, a particular sample. So what we can do is that we weigh out a particular sample of a solid, all right, of your hydrated salt, and then we heat it to remove your water of crystallization. So the concept involved here is that when you heat a hydrated salt, your water of crystallization will be driven off. Bear in mind that your water of crystallization is not chemically combined with your sodium carbonate. So on just gentle heating, actually, um, the water of crystallization would be driven off. Okay, so you need to heat, uh, for example, one gram of the hydrated salt for let's say five minutes. Okay, and then after that, you allow it to cool, you weigh it using a weighing balance. Okay. And then you repeat the heating. Now this is important because you need to ensure that um, all the water of crystallization has been driven off. So you need to continue heating until you have two measurements which shows the same mass. Meaning after on prolonged heating, on further heating, there's no further loss in water of crystallization. So that would indicate to us that all the water of crystallization has been um, completely driven off. So how do we find the mass of water then? The mass of water would be equivalent to the initial mass of the uh, sample, let's say one gram, minus the final mass of the sample. Okay, so for example, if the final mass is 0 0.8 grams, that means that the mass of water is 0 0.2 grams. With that, the subsequent um, discussion becomes very easy because percentage by mass of water would be the mass of water over the total mass of the sample, which is one gram, assuming that you have um, written down one gram in your planning answer times 100. For the next question, determine the percentage by mass of chloride in seawater. This also requires a gravimetric approach. So what we do is first we weigh out a certain mass of seawater. So for example, uh, let's say 10 grams. Okay, so this seawater contains chloride 
So how do we find the amount of chloride in there is this, that we need to add excess of a reactant that forms a precipitate with chloride. Now in QA, we have learned that to test for chloride, we add silver nitrate. Okay, so the silver nitrate would precipitate with the chloride um, to form your insoluble silver chloride. Okay, so the important thing to take note here is that silver nitrate must be added in excess so that all your chloride is precipitated. Okay, so from after precipitation, we need to perform a filtration to obtain your silver chloride in the, in the residue. Okay, and then importantly, you need to let it you need to wash it with a bit of water and to let it dry fully before weighing again. So for example, if after weighing, you get a mass of um, maybe um, 9 grams. Okay, so what this 9 grams tells you is that you have 9 grams of silver chloride. Now does that mean that you have 9 grams of chloride? Answer is no. So what, how do you get the mass of chloride is this? You have the mass of silver chloride. With that, you can find number of moles of silver chloride, which is 9 divided by the molar mass of silver chloride. And then after that, that will give us the number of moles of chloride. Why? Because from the formula of silver chloride, one mole of silver chloride has contains one mole of chloride ions. Okay? So from the number of moles of chloride ions, we can find the mass of chloride by taking number of moles of chloride times 35.5. Now take note that we are looking at the chloride ion, so it's not chlorine gas, so the molar mass is only 35.5. And the fact that it's an ion would make no difference um, to the atomic mass, um, reason being the mass of electrons are negligible. The next type of planning question would be your qualitative planning questions. In qualitative experiments, we want to find out what is present. So an example would be your 2021 planning question where you were given a sample of calcium carbonate which may contain some zinc carbonate impurities. So you have to design a test to find out whether the zinc carbonate impurities are indeed present. So for qualitative experiments it has to um, uh, it has to be related to QA which we have learned in the syllabus and in this question the difference lies in the metal cation now this means that we need to think of a QA test which will allow us to distinguish between zinc and calcium many students will be able to quickly recall that the definitive test um, to distinguish between zinc and calcium ions would be to add aqueous ammonia. Okay, reason being zinc would give a white PPT soluble in excess, whereas calcium would not give any PPT. However, there is a catch for QA tests to work the metal must exist as aqueous ions. Okay, so usually when we add sodium hydroxide or ammonia, it is to aqueous metal ions, which will allow us to identify um, which ions are present. In this case, zinc carbonate and calcium carbonate, which we have learned in our solubility rules, they are insoluble in water. Okay, so by adding aqueous ammonia to the two solid samples, um, there will not be any observations because they will remain insoluble in your aqueous ammonia. Okay, so for questions like this, the first thing you need to do is you need to convert your zinc carbonate and calcium carbonate into aqueous solutions. Since the carbonates are insoluble, it means that we need to react the carbonates with something to form a soluble salt. And we have learned in acids and bases that carbonates react with acids. So we can react the carbonates with a suitable acid to turn it into a soluble salt. 
right? And the most ideal acid to use would be your nitric acid because the salt form would be a nitrate and all nitrates are soluble. Okay, so I think most students would forget the very important prerequisite step, which is to react with nitric acid. And then only after they have been converted into the met aqueous metal ions, then you add aqueous ammonia dropwise followed by in excess. Now, if your zinc impurities were indeed present, what you would see is that at some point um, on adding aqueous ammonia, a white PPT would form, but then later on be dissolved again. If in, at no point do you see a white PPT, it means that you do not have any zinc carbonate impurities. So for qualitative questions, what is required in a question, you again need the procedure. Okay, the steps, the chemicals um, required in this case would be your nitric acid as well as aqueous ammonia. And the apparatus in this case, it will be quite simple. It's just your test tube. And for discussion, um, like I mentioned, after adding your nitric acid and aqueous ammonia, how do you then know whether zinc is indeed present? And lastly, if the question requires, you need to tell us the precautions and assumptions. So here is a similar qualitative planning practice where we have to plan an experiment to distinguish between three solid samples. The key term here is solid, um, calcium oxide, zinc oxide, and sodium oxide. So once again, the difference would be your metal cations and we can easily use some QA test um, to distinguish between the three cations. However, importantly, you need to recall that calcium and zinc oxide, they are insoluble in water. All right, so um, before you perform any QA test, before you add aqueous ammonia or sodium hydroxide, you need to first convert the solid samples into aqueous solutions by adding nitric acid. Okay, so similarly, you need to add nitric acid to dissolve all three solids. For sodium oxide, actually, you don't need nitric acid, but um, uh, you can, for consistency, you can just add it to all three solids. And number two, you can add, in this case, um, uh, you can add sodium hydroxide dropwise followed by in excess. Right, that will allow us to distinguish between the three. Why? Because calcium would give a white PPT insoluble in excess, whereas zinc would give a white PPT soluble in excess, whereas sodium would not give any PPT. Now, the third type of planning question is on preparation, meaning they want to see how you can prepare something. Examples would be the 2021 um, planning question where you are supposed to prepare dilute hydrochloric acid and the 2019 planning question where you have to prepare a salt which is sodium hydrogen sulfate. In the 2021 planning question, um, in the question they mentioned that they were given a 1 mole per dm cube hydrochloric acid sample and they are supposed to prepare a 0 0.1 mole per dm cube hydrochloric acid sample. So from the concentrations involved, we can see that you need to do a dilution. All right. And um, a key part of the planning would be how much you need to dilute the acid. So in this case, from by looking at the concentrations, we need to do a 10 time dilution. The question further tells you that you need to prepare 100 centimeter cube of the diluted acid. So that means that we need to actually use 10 centimeter cube of your concentrated acid and mix with 90 centimeter cube of water. Okay, so this is um, what I think the examiners were looking out for. However, at higher levels, you will learn that by mixing 10 centimeter cube of an acid, a concentrated acid, 
with 90 centimeter cube of deionized water actually you do not or you may not get 100 centimeter cube of solution okay so at higher levels um, we would use something called a volumetric flask you would add your 10 centimeter cube of your acid and then top up the solution with water until it reaches 100 centimeter cube okay for the details on the planning please look at the um, video on solving quant solving titration calculations in that video i actually went through this question in detail the 2019 planning question requires you to prepare a salt sodium hydrogen sulfate now uh, we don't really learn this salt in the syllabus however in the question they mentioned that it is soluble and the fact that it contains sodium it is a soluble spa salt which means that we need to use the titration method okay so in your titration method the starting reagents would be an acid and an alkali in this case the acid is sulfuric acid and the alkali is sodium hydroxide now the question further tells you that the reaction of sulfuric acid with sodium hydroxide occurs in two steps all right and the first step would actually produce sodium hydrogen sulfate and the second step produces sodium sulfate so that is a hint to you that when you perform the titration method recall we need to perform it two times in the first time we need to record the volume for example if we have um, sodium hydroxide in the buret and sulfuric acid in the conical flask um, in the titration method we need to first perform a titration with an indicator to find the volume of sodium hydroxide required to reach the end point now the concept involved here is this when you when the indicator changes color for um, this titration it means that your sulfuric acid has been fully reacted to form sodium sulfate so let's say if the title value is 20 centimeter cube when we repeat the experiment without the indicator if we were to add 20 centimeter cube the salt that we get is sodium sulfate so to stop at sodium hydrogen sulfate we need to add half the volume of your sodium hydroxide so for such um, uh, tricky maneuvers they are usually hinted to you in the stem of the question so you need to read very very carefully now for preparation type planning questions um, what is the only thing that's required is the procedure where you need to tell us the steps the chemicals involved as well as the apparatus used to um, in the procedure sometimes they will ask you for precautions and assumptions but in this case the thing that's missing is the discussion there's no need for you to discuss um, because there's no data that's being collected here is a practice of a preparation type planning question where you're supposed to um, prepare a sample of sulfur now sulfur is not exactly a salt so we haven't exactly learned how to prepare sulfur but if you re read the question um, they show you a reaction where you mix two solutions you get a precipitate form uh, amongst other solutions so when you mix two solutions and you get a precipitate um, over here which is also suggested in the question it tells you that you need to use the precipitation method okay so once you have identified that the the answer becomes very straightforward um, in precipitation method you mix the two reagents you stir until no further solid is formed you filter to obtain the precipitate in the residue and then you wash and dry it the last type of planning question is the investigative type uh, of planning question it used to be very very popular uh, however it hasn't come out in a while now in investigative type planning questions you would need to perform the experiment more than one time okay 
and in the separate uh, runs experimental runs you need to change a particular variable so in investigative type questions you need to be very clear what is your independent variable and what is your dependent variable okay another type of variable that you need to keep in mind is your control variables meaning the things that you need to keep constant um, between the two experimental runs an example of an investigative planning experiment would be um, this to plan an experiment to determine the effect of manganese oxide on the speed of decomposition of hydrogen peroxide so the concept involved is this hydrogen peroxide is actually a very unstable substance so when left on its own it actually slowly decomposes to form water and oxygen gas okay and this reaction is well known to be um, catalyzed by your manganese 4 oxide which is a black solid so over here we cannot just apply whatever you know but we need to plan an experiment to indeed prove that manganese uh, 4 oxide is a catalyst so in this case um, what we can do since a gas is being produced remember speed of reaction experiments 99% of them produces a gas because when a reaction produces a gas we can easily monitor the speed by me measuring the volume of gas produced per unit time so the setup would look very very similar to your um, quantitative planning experiments where you have a gas range connected to a conical flask with a delivery tube so over here we still need a stopwatch um, to measure a certain um, time duration so the in this particular planning the independent variable would be whether you add the catalyst or not and the dependent variable would be the volume of gas or volume of oxygen produced in a fixed period of time for example in five minutes okay so for such planning questions you need to tell us the procedure as always and discussion becomes important because you need to tell us from the dependent variable that is obtained how can we then arrive at a conclusion for example in this question if the experiment conducted in the presence of manganese 4 oxide produce a larger volume of oxygen gas compared to that without manganese 4 oxide then manganese 4 oxide indeed is an is a catalyst for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide in the event where the experiment with the addition of manganese 4 oxide produce the same volume of gas as that without manganese 4 oxide then manganese 4 oxide is not a catalyst for the reaction a second um, example is this to plan an experiment involving temperature change to determine whether an unknown acid with a specific concentration is mono or dibasic now um, at first glance it may seem like a very very unfamiliar planning but essentially the concept involved is this that if the acid is a mono basic acid then when we have one mole per dm cube of the acid we will have one mole per dm cube of hydrogen ions and if it's a dibasic acid then we would have two moles per dm cube of hydrogen ions okay so the key thing that we need to find out here is whether one mole of the acid yeah, reacts with how many moles of your sodium hydroxide okay and um, we can easily perform a titration but since the question requests for a temperature change or calorimetric experiment this is what we can do we can actually have two experiments the independent variable would be your um, number of moles or amount of sodium hydroxide okay in the first experiment we add 
we react one mole of acid with one mole of sodium hydroxide. In the second experiment, we react with two moles of sodium hydroxide. Your dependent variable will be the temperature change. Okay. Now, since if the acid is a monobasic acid, all right, in the second experiment where we have two moles of sodium hydroxide, it would mean that we have excess of sodium hydroxide and the temperature change would be similar to that of experiment one. Okay, so, and um, for the case where it's diabasic, when you add two moles of sodium hydroxide, your sodium hydroxide will be reacted completely. Um, therefore, it will give out even more heat than in experiment one. So the discussion would go something like this. If the temperature change in experiment two is higher than that of experiment one, it means that your acid is a diabasic acid. If your um, temperature change for experiment two is the same or similar to experiment one, then your acid is a monobasic acid. So again, in this video, we have seen many uh, examples of planning questions and somehow they may seem very um, disconnected and you need to learn all of them in isolation, but um, it will help if you can identify what type of planning question and to recall what is needed um, as well as the general approaches associated with each type of planning question.